homily or meditation is 2 Kings 5. And the title of the message might be The Outsider Who Got In and The Insider Who Got Out. 2 Kings 5. I was a daddy's girl when I was coming up, maybe about the, the age of Rob's daughter Isabella, maybe four or five. And I liked to watch my daddy shave. And so I would go into the bathroom and sit on the toilet seat and watch him shave. One reason why I liked to watch him was he would, he would say silly rhymes to me to make me laugh. And one of the silly rhymes that he said to me was this one. I still remember it. One day in the middle of the night, two dead guys got up to fight. Back to back, they faced each other, drew their swords, and shot each other. A deaf policeman heard their cries. He came and killed those two dead guys. If you don't believe me, ask the blind man. He saw it too. <laughs> and that would always make me just laugh and laugh. Because that's an ironic sort of thing. Irony is defined this way. A state of affairs or an event that seems deliberately contrary to what one expects and is often amusing as a result. That was amusing to me. An American writer called O. Henry was the master of ironic storytelling. He was known for his surprise endings. Another short story, uh, his most famous one is called The Gift of the Magi. You might see it at Christmas time. But another one of his was called the Ransom of Red Chief. In this story, a hyperactive child has been rampaging around the town dressed as an Indian chief, causing trouble in every direction. A couple of bumbling kidnappers snatch the mischievous son of this leading citizen, and they ask for ransom, as is usual in a kidnapping case. The father refuses to pay. However, Red Chief so torments his captors that in the end, they pay the father to take the child back. That's ironic. Irony is God's preferred method of operating in the world. God often works in ways that are deliberately contrary to what is expected. The coming of Jesus Christ to this world is largely unacknowledged by the leaders of his own people because God was working in an unexpected way. The Messiah born to a poor couple in a barn, the Messiah, a refugee fleeing to Egypt, the Messiah brought up in a disreputable town of Nazareth, ironic. That the chosen one should die a publicly humiliating death was contrary to expectations. The Jews missed the Messiah because the aspects of Jesus' life did not fit the stereotype Messiah King pattern. This 2 Kings 5 account is an episode of Elisha's ministry that is ironic on several levels. Elisha was the prophet of God in Israel, that is the northern kingdom of the two Jewish kingdoms. Aram was a hostile nation on Israel's border, now probably very close to the borders of present day Syria. The two countries were often at war. At this time, there was an uneasy truce between Aram and Israel. So here's what happened. The king of, Aram, of Aram's top general had a huge problem. He had contracted leprosy. A number of skin diseases were considered leprosy, not all of them uh, as fatal as the leprosy we think of. If General Naaman was still in the early stages of, uh, or in, in the, maybe in the not, not most severe form of the disease, he was still able to carry on his duties and be in the king's inner circle. But still, the condition was considered a death sentence and called for quarantine. Naaman was desperately seeking for a cure that could not be found in Aram. Doubtless, Rimmon, the god of the Arameans, had been consulted. Vast amounts of money had doubtless been paid to doctors and priests. Nothing had been accomplished, and Naaman's leprosy persisted. A young Israeli servant girl, kidnapped from her home, was made to Naaman's wife. The slave girl mentioned that if Naaman would go to the prophet in Israel, he would be healed. The general was desperate enough to seek help from his traditional enemies, and Elisha the prophet consented to see him. 
So the great military leader and his entourage arrived at Elisha's house in great pomp with cartloads of silver, gold, and fine clothes as payment for a cure. Naaman expected an almost royal welcome and a complicated healing ritual from the Jewish prophet. Instead, he got snubbed. The prophet refused to come out to receive the general personally and sent out a servant with a brief cryptic message. Go and wash seven times in the muddy Jordan River and be cured. Naaman was enraged. No respect for his rank and a silly remedy that didn't have a chance of working. I think in spite of his angry reaction that Naaman might have been a likable man. Here's why I think that. People of low rank, whom an arrogant man might have abused, seemed eager to help him. The servant girl of his household, who could have thought, well, good, this man who's holding me in captivity away from my home, I hope he rots. But no, she seemed eager to help him. His uh, officers, under his command, they wished him well. They encouraged him, even though he thought it was a silly uh, treatment, to go and try it out. What do you have to lose? So. I'm inclined to like him. So Naaman allowed himself to be persuaded to drive his chariot to the small, muddy river. He dipped his body in the water once, twice, and finally seven times. When he arose from the water after obeying God's representative, his skin was as soft and perfect as a child's. The general was awed amazed and humbled. His gods could not cure, but Israel's God was real and powerful. As quickly as he could, Naaman returned to Elisha's house to express his gratitude. He tried again to give his extravagant gifts, but the prophet refused them. He wanted to make the point that God's favor could not be purchased. So the cured man made a request instead. He wanted some dirt from the prophet's yard so he could worship Israel's God on Israel's soil. Mm -hmm. Naaman received a priceless gift of life and hope without cost, received only by a step of obedience. As a result of his miraculous cure, Naaman acknowledged Israel's God as the only God in the world and vowed to sacrifice only to the Lord, regardless of what his own culture and king might think. Remarkably, the general recognized at once that he had a conflicting duty that might compromise his new commitment to Yahweh. He was required to accompany the king as the king worshipped Rimmon, the god of Aram. Possibly he was the king's bodyguard protecting him as he worshipped. So Naaman asked Elisha if he could be pardoned for bowing in the temple for doing a civic duty that he could not see a way to avoid. Elisha did not comment on Naaman's dilemma, but blessed him with Israel's traditional blessing, go in peace. So the general returned to his home, transformed both physically and spiritually. The outsider, Israel's enemy, had come in, into the faith of the one true God. Ironically, most of the Israeli population had turned away from Yahweh, but a Gentile army man likely responsible for attacks on Israel, responded to God and was accepted by him. The outsider got in, into favor with the God of the universe, a beautifully ironic work of God. Jesus himself commented on Naaman's faith and obedience in Luke 4. To his hometown folks in Nazareth, Jesus said, there were many people with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, Yet not one was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. The synagogue crowd was offended that outsiders might enjoy God's favor, while Jewish insiders would miss God's blessing. The Second Kings 5 account also told the story of an insider who chose to go out, to leave the place of God, to leave the service of the Lord. Elisha had a servant named Gehazi. This man had assisted the prophet and had personally participated in such miracles as the raising of a dead boy. 
Gehazi had, been, had seen the firsthand the reality and power of the one true God. Yet, this man who was so close to God's mighty acts was morally bankrupt himself. In spite of observing the healing of Naaman, Gehazi had no personal loyalty or love for Yahweh. He tracked down Naaman, got himself some gold, some silver rather, and fine robes. In the awesome presence of the God of the universe, he thought he could get away with massive fraud and deceit. Elisha confronted his servant with his eagle acts, evil acts, and as punishment, assigned Gehazi to bear the leprosy which, of which Naaman had been cured. Now Gehazi and his family were to be outside, outcasts from society, stricken with the kind of illness that most people thought of as a curse from God. He was cut off from temple worship and quarantined from public life. A man who had been close to holy things was now forced outside, the insider who went out. Tragically ironic. <coughs> and these epic events were set in motion by a young slave girl who kept her faith in God, the God of her native land, though that God had not delivered her from her captivity. In the face of her many unanswered questions, she still believed that God was real, powerful, and compassionate. I wonder how she felt when she saw her cured master returning home, his mules loaded with dirt from her home country. Today, God is still working in his usual ironic way, deliberately contrary to our stereotypes and expectations. Even people we consider enemies or pagans are being prepared by God to hear and respond to the truth. We shouldn't consider any person that we meet, no matter how reprehensible we might think they are, as a person with whom God is not dealing. God is drawing every person, dealing with every person. Through tragedy, perhaps, such as Naaman suffered, toward the salvation of Christ, if only they will move toward truth and obedience. Today, outsiders are still coming into the family of faith by the grace of God. The door of mercy is open to all who want to enter. It is also sadly true that some people we consider insiders, spiritual leaders, are choosing to step out, outside of the people of God. Some who take part in powerful ministries may not have hearts truly aligned with the Lord. It is dreadfully dangerous to be part of God's work, close to his actions, without allowing God to transform and change us. We observe the fall of a Christian leader, and we wonder how she or he could do such a thing. An evil heart is exposed beneath a pious exterior. An apparent insider has gone out into the cold night of disobedience, like Judas, one of the privileged twelve, like Demas, the co-worker of Paul, like I myself could do, if I am careless of holy things and cold in my relationship with the Lord. Instead, let's be insiders who stay in, close to the heart of God, as well as the work of God, Let's take for our example a simple child, snatched from her home, who against all odds keeps on trusting the God she knows is real, powerful, loving. She is motivated to help others get in touch with that God, even those people she might regard as enemies. This unknown, unnamed girl was the catalyst for a mighty object lesson for her own era and for all the people of God. The Lord often chooses to act in unexpected ways. A hymn written in the 1800s by a nearly blind Scottish preacher, George Matheson, <coughs> speaks of the seemingly contradictory relationships we have with the Lord in our spiritual journey. Even the title is paradoxical. Make me a captive, Lord. Make me a captive, Lord and then I shall be free. Force me to render up my sword 
and I shall conquer thee. I sink in life's alarms when by myself I stand. Imprison me within thine arms, and strong shall be my hand. Ironic. My heart is poor and weak until it master find. It has no spring of action, sure, it varies with the wind. It cannot freely move till thou hast wrought its chain. Enslave it with thy matchless love, and deathless it shall reign. My power is faint and low until I learn to serve. It lacks the needed fire to glow, it lacks the breeze to nerve. It cannot drive the world until itself be driven. Its flag can only be unfurled when thou shalt breathe from heaven. My will is not my own till thou hast made it thine. If it would reach a monarch's throne, it must its crown resign. Paradoxical, contradictory. It only stands unbent amid the clashing strife when on thy bosom it has lent and found in thee its life. Jesus said, the one who seeks to save his life will lose it. But the one who loses his life for my sake will find it. Contradictory, ironic, paradoxical, like so much of what God chooses to do with us mm. in this world. Let's pray. Father, we came to you with nothing to recommend us except your great love and your choosing to set your favor upon us, to send Christ to die, to receive us guilty sinners, and make us by the power of your spirit into your children and take us to live with you forever. How paradoxical that we who are enemies of God have been reconciled by the death of his son, made into his beloved, and set on a direction of union with you forever. We don't deserve it, we can't deserve it. We want to respond in obedience, to say yes at every contradictory turn in the road. When it doesn't like, seem like things make sense, when it doesn't seem like you make sense, help us to remember who you are and what you have done and the way you make the weak strong and uh, cleanse the guilty and make them into your people. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. What is 376? Is this the tune to... Uh